Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Edna DeVore, and I'm the Director of Education and Public Outreach and the Acting CEO of SETI Institute, and I am entirely delighted to be able to interview Richard Rhodes, who has for a very long time been a complete hero of mine as a writer of history mm. and a writer of the history of science. Thank you. You're welcome. He is the author or the editor of 24 books, including The Making of the Atomic Bomb, for which he won a Pulitzer Prize in nonfiction, a National Book Award, and a National Book Critics Circle Award. That was the first book of yours that I read. And I'll admit terribly that I bought it at a used bookstore in a complete whim. Oh, okay. And I was completely fascinated, and it set me off on a pathway of reading biographies of physicists and all the physicists you talk about. And I now have a long shelf of these. <laughs> but then I also had an opportunity about a year ago to go to a talk that you were giving, and I showed up with a brand new copy yes. that you signed for me that was great and one for my son. He's subsequently spent almost 30 years looking at the history, in my mind, of modern physics and atomic weapons and their social implications. Um, separately, he wrote a fabulous biography of John James Audubon, which really gives you insight into 19th century America. And uh, his most recent book is really quite fun. It's called Hetty's Folly. And it's about Hetty Lamar and her invention of frequency hopping, which everyone uses in their modern electronics, their phones, etc. So quite a diverse background, but always a writer. And so Richard, what motivates if, you if to become a writer? If they're under 70, we have to tell them who Hedy Lamar is. Oh, Hedy Lamar was the most beautiful woman in the world. Hollywood superstar back in the 40s, yeah. She's still the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so please, tell us, what motivated you to become a writer? Oh, that's funny. You know, as a teenager, I was going to be a minister of the Methodist Church since I was growing up in Independence, Missouri. In fact, the church I attended was half a block from Harry Truman's summer house. So we would see the president come out on his sort of little stoop in front of his house and allow himself to be photographed with tourists. But I think at that time and place, the early 1950s in the middle of the country, the only source of questions about the morals and philosophic existential issues of life was through the church. That's where these issues were discussed and almost nowhere else. When I got to college and discovered there was something called philosophy, I sort of jettisoned all the religious <laughs> part. That I realized was sort of superstructure. But the question really was dealing with how we live as human beings, what our values are, what the consequences are of all of that, could be dealt with directly. But then I went by way of writing novels. My first of my first five books before the making of the atomic bomb, four were novels. <clears throat> and it was only when I failed to put together a novel I had a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1976 for a novel that I had proposed that would be set at Los Alamos during the Second World War. And it was the only book I've ever tried to write that just didn't work. I had a contract and I sent it to my publisher and they rather reluctantly said, we really can't publish this. So I agonized over what had happened and I realized that the story of the development of the bombs and all of the complicated human histories that were involved in that, of Jews who were thrown out of Nazi Germany, physicists who came to this country grateful to find a safe place to be and then realized that Germany might be working on a bomb and, and, and confronted the horror of a, of a Third Reich uh, ruling the world for the next thousand years with a nuclear arsenal. All of those issues together simply overwhelmed this little love story I was trying to write in the novel. And with that came the, the, the kind of fundamental realization that the story itself as history was waiting to be told. And just at that particular time, this is where, this is where accident and, and 
uh, fortuity comes in. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission declassified a vast amount of the scientific literature of the Manhattan Project that had up to that time been secret and therefore no one had been able to write from the documents, but had only, as in the book, uh, Brighter Than a Thousand Suns, had had to base it on interviews, which are imperfect vehicles at, at best. So I really had this coming together of different strains. And of course, if you want to talk about philosophic and moral and ethical issues in the human world, it's hard to think of a better version of that than the question of nuclear weapons. So you've spent <coughs> almost 30 years writing about that, and what do you think the, the future, both destructive and non-destructive, is of this genie we've let out of the bottle of atomic energy? Because you work, in, you work in, at Stanford in a, a community of people on yeah, this. Yes, who, who really do focus on the whole question of the international relations that have yes. resulted as a consequence, really, of the introduction of nuclear weapons. Well, on the one hand, it's really fascinating and profound that no nuclear weapon has been exploded in anger since Nagasaki. Something changed. In fact, if you graph man-made deaths from war, starting around the 18th century. They increase almost exponentially, fundamentally with the introduction of the Industrial Revolution and the industrialization of killing technologies to a peak 15 million dead in 1943, which was both the Second World War and the Holocaust. And then they drop off abruptly to about one to two million a year after 1945 and basically stay there to the present. I mean, that's a singularity, uh, to borrow a term from physics. That is a profound change. That doesn't mean that nuclear weapons keep us safe, because I don't think they do, I mean, by definition. They're sitting there in their arsenals and their silos, uh, potentially capable of destroying the entire human world. And I'll talk about that maybe more in a moment. But but at least they were so terrifying that even uh, species as contentious and uh, as, as ours managed to say, we really can't use them. And if you look over the years of the Cold War, you find that nations, powerful nations, were prepared to lose wars rather than use nuclear weapons. I mean, the United States with Vietnam, the Soviet Union with Afghanistan to take two obvious examples. So something changed. And what changed was the capacity to destroy large numbers of human beings uh, with the push of a button, as we say. We don't use them because we're afraid to use them. But for a lot of interesting and complicated reasons, we seem to think we need to keep them around and in large numbers. And that for a long time looked like simply killing millions of human beings, horrible enough. But then some scientists started, I think you know the story, Carl Sagan and some others who were looking at death storms on Mars and the extraordinary drop in temperature that occurs when a global death storm occurs on Mars, realized that maybe something like that might happen with a nuclear a major nuclear war, and did the studies that led to the concept of nuclear winter, and produced some scientific papers that I think nailed that concept pretty clearly, and then faced uh, the resistance of people like Edward Teller, who was arguing, oh, maybe the world would actually cool off. Uh, Teller, who didn't want anything to get in the way of more and better bombs, after the end of the Cold War, all of that sort of fell away. But then in 2007, some of the same scientists who worked with Sagan on the earlier studies realized that with the development of much more sophisticated computer models to deal with the global warming issue, they had models that might give them a better sense of how accurate their original predictions were. They used very, very two-dimensional 
crude models back in the mid-1980s for their original studies. This time around with a full in-depth three-dimensional model of the atmosphere, they discovered that, that nuclear winter from a full all-out nuclear war would have been, would be even worse than, than they had predicted before. That it would lead to 20 or 30 years of annual mean temperatures 20 degrees below what they normally were, which would basically mean the destruction of all agriculture in the world and the starvation of all the human beings in the world. But then, and this is what interests me about where we are right now, then they thought, I wonder what a little regional nuclear war would look like. Would it be so, would it, would it have any kind of global consequences climatically? So they looked at 50 Hiroshima-sized, which is 15 kiloton, nuclear weapons from Pakistan to India, and 50 Hiroshima-sized, 15 kiloton nuclear weapons from India to Pakistan. And they presumed that those weapons would be exploded over cities, because what else would you do with so few weapons? So we're talking about one and a half megatons, which is smaller than some US weapons in the arsenal, single weapons. And they discovered to their horror, and you can find this animated graph online if you look up uh, the name of one or another of the scientists, Toon or Owen. They found to their horror that a pall of smoke from burning cities full of combustible materials would slowly spread around the entire globe and drop the average annual temperature worldwide by two to three degrees, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that takes us back to the little ice age of the 15th through 18th centuries in the Northern Hemisphere. So they estimated that there would be 20 million prompt deaths from this little regional nuclear war and two billion deaths from starvation around the world because of crop failures as a result of the lowering, lowering of the temperature. So this is all still immensely relevant now. And the fact that we keep these weapons in our arsenal the way we keep gold at Fort Knox as tokens of national power, we and the Soviets primarily, we've got more than 90% of them, doesn't mean that we're out of the woods. That's what I concluded. Right, and, and now I've, I've read quite recently that it seems like smaller regimes around the world are endeavoring to acquire nuclear weapons because it's almost like a status symbol. Yeah. In fact, when India did its first sequence of bomb tests, you remember India tested one so-called peaceful nuclear explosive in 1974, and then in 1998 ran a series of tests, some of which were supposed to be thermonuclear, although they seemed to have been duds at that point. And then Pakistan followed almost instantly with an even longer series of tests. The, the, the defense minister of, of India said, as a, because of those tests, he said, big boys are gonna have to let us sit at the table now. We've shown that we, we belong there. So they have become, as I said, tokens of national power. And in a way, they're thought of as, as unusable, not to be used, quote, deterrence, unquote, as if deterrence ever was more than the figment of the Rand Corporation's imagination, some way to kind of quantify the whole business of nuclear war. But they're still there. A friend of mine, Richard Butler, who was the Australian ambassador to the United Nations and for many years afterwards was Australia's ambassador at large for nuclear disarmament like to talk about what he called the axiom of proliferation. She said it's as certain as a physics axiom or a philosophic axiom, and that is, so long as any nation has nuclear weapons, others will seek to acquire them. And that's, of course, the, the heart of the dilemma. Everyone thinks they should have a few to bolster their prestige, to, they think, defend themselves, but the price of that is others as well. And then listening, I was listening carefully to President Obama's speech in Prague in the first spring of his presidency in 2009. 
and I heard him say, I don't know if he was aware of it, but he said something that I thought of as a corollary to the axiom of proliferation. He said, so long as we and others have nuclear weapons, the, it's obvious that they're eventually going to be used. You put those two things together and you throw in nuclear winter or nuclear autumn, whatever you want to call it, and you realize that we're still at the center of this fundamental dilemma of this glittering source of enormous destructive power that at the same time destroys those who try to use it. And so do you foresee in your next project continuing to write about nuclear weapons or do you have a different project in mind? <laughs> Hedy Lamarr was a nice excursion it I mean, was, most yes. of the way through the book. It's a delight. Hedy came up because I run a committee at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation that supports the writing of books about science and technology. And we were thinking of a list of 20th century American or world inventors. And Hetty turned up on the list and I was intrigued and I said, I'll try that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm delighted that I did. It was an excursion and a delightful one. It's a great way to spend a nice long Saturday. She, um, I really think I've finished the nuclear subject for now. Four volumes, a quartet of books which carried the story from the discovery of the electron, the first evidence that there really was such a thing as a physical atom in the world, to today. So I'm going to have to wait 10 or 20 years, I should live so long, uh, to write the, any other volumes on the subject. I'm right now working on a book about a period before the Second World War when a lot of what came to be the massive destructive methods of the Second World War were first battle tested, and that's the Spanish Civil War. There have been a lot of books about the Spanish Civil War. None, however, have pulled together the artists, Picasso painting Guernica, for example, the writers, Hemingway, Martha Gellhorn, Hemingway writing for whom the bell tolls, but also the technology, and particularly the military and medical technology. The idea of storing blood and taking it to the front lines to transfuse wounded soldiers was first developed during the Spanish Civil War. The use of casting as a way of containing and controlling serious wounds of limbs was first developed during the Spanish Civil War. Methods of anesthesia and the introduction of the first antibiotics, sulfur drugs, came as well during that war. Methods of bombing cities, the famous bombing of Guernica, uh, which was a fundamentally a firebombing that destroyed an entire city of 7,000 people and killed about 1,000 of those 7,000. And of course then led Picasso, gave Picasso the subject for his arguably best and most well-known painting. So this interesting complex of you got a war, what do you do with it? And we have artists and writers and, and, and engineers and military guys and the Condor Legion out of Nazi Germany. All of these things coming together around this event is what I want to try to do in this book. Excellent. I'd like to, to open up the floor to questions. And again, we have lights in our eyes. So if you have a question for Richard Rhodes, Adrian, I can see you. <laughs> Richard, I, I was wondering in, in writing about uh, nuclear weapons, uh, did you feel at any stage uh, inhibited by uh, the fact that you could be giving away some secrets in your books that might not be, uh, that might be used by other powers? You know, that's an interesting question because you would think not. Uh, you would think that, that the information that's really important to the building a nuclear weapon doesn't get released. And generally speaking, that's true. Even the famous photographs that came out of Israel, I'm blocking on the name of the, the technician, Mordecai Venunu. Uh, those photographs are online and you can look at some very nice bomb cores with some tampers around them and so forth, but you couldn't build a bomb with that even if you had the plutonium. The one time that I thought I'd better restrain myself was right after the end of the old Soviet Union early in 1992, you remember the Soviet Union fell apart at the end of 91. Early in 92, a lot of the atomic scientists from the Soviet complexes 
suddenly found themselves in the position to be comfortable to talk about what their work had been. And again, they weren't giving away any secrets. But the KGB decided that in order to show how valuable it had been to the Soviet state, they should declassify and publish in historical articles uh, information, for example, about Klaus Fuchs and the American bomb design that he delivered to the Soviets. And in that article, there was a drawing of the various layers of an implosion device with the actual measurement in centimeters of each of the different shells, starting with the little, the little initiator at the middle and then the plutonium core and then the tamper of uranium and then so on and so on out to the various high explosives. And that was published to the horror of the, of the former Soviet atomic scientists who immediately got the document classified again, saying it violated the, the uh, non-proliferation treaty, which it did, publishing it, and having all the issues of the journal pulled from public circulation. Well, I really wanted to see that, of course. So I was working with a very canny uh, young Soviet uh, Russian geologist who actually was Yelena Bonner's secretary for her organization. And he said, Sasha said, look, I think I know where I can find a copy. And he jumped on the night train, we were in Moscow at the time, jumped on the night train to uh, what was soon to be again St. Petersburg, and he went to an institute there and asked to see this particular issue of this historical journal. And they said, Conrad, we can't, we can't let you see that. It's just been reclassified. So Sasha being very, very resourceful thought, well, there's a public library across the street he went over to the public library, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and they made a copy. And he put that in his pocket and brought it with me. Well, when I published that information, I took out those dimensions. And in fact, I destroyed the document. Even I don't remember what they were. But so generally, one wants to get this information out there, but not at that level of detail. Yes, over here. Bill Bryson, in one of his books, says that a nuke may have been exploded in the outback in Australia. When? Uh, I think he says it's young, uh, the Supreme Truth cult did it. So. Oh, no, I think I know where, you, where that comes from, though. Om Shinriko was, most of you will have heard of it, the Japanese so-called cult that got interested in, in developing weapons of mass destruction and was actually caught when they tested a dilute form of, of uh, nerve gas that they had put together in the, Japan, in the uh, Tokyo subway. They also were interested in developing uh, nuclear weapons and they tried to buy nuclear material from the former Soviet Union, uh, no takers, nobody wants to sell that stuff to anybody. Uh, but they did buy a ranch on some outback land where there was supposed to be uranium ore in the neighborhood. In other words, they were going to start at the beginning and, and mine the ore and turn it into yellow cake and then turn it into metal. And, and I, don't know, I don't know how they thought they were going to enrich it. It takes a pretty big operation to enrich uranium, as we know from the various places where it's being done around the world. So I think that was probably an exaggeration and elaboration into folklore of what they were doing. Yeah. Was Oppenheimer nuts? I mean, he seems to have been a little bit touched. Why do you say that? Is there anything that I've read? Maybe because of the, Red, the stuff that comes out during the Red Scare. I think Oppenheimer was one of the most superbly sane people we've had in this world in recent centuries. He was someone who was fascinated with and horrified by the prospects that followed from the discovery of nuclear fission and its application to weapons and also to energy. He ran afoul of Louis Strauss, one of the slimier members of our government over the years, who didn't like Oppenheimer personally and thought he was an immoral person, 
because he'd had an extramarital affair at one point in his life. And Strauss managed to destroy Oppenheimer by having his security clearance lifted. The one thing that he needed to have in order to advise the government about what to do with this huge new human discovery and really did destroy Oppenheimer. He was, according to the people who knew him, never the same afterward. He was kind of a hollow public man after that. But no, I think Oppenheimer was one of the first people with the help of his mentor Niels Bohr, the Danish physicist, really to understand just how profound a change in human affairs, the discovery of how to release the energy in the nucleus of the atom really was going to be. <clears throat> we haven't begun to shake all that down to this day. We're still wrestling with each other about nuclear energy. We're still in the middle of piles of nuclear weapons enough to, as I said before, take out the entire human world. Uh, we're, we're still wrestling with all of that and Oppenheimer was one of the first to try and figure out what on earth we were going to do with all of this. Well, I would like to Thank Richard Rhodes very much for a very interesting interview. And I also want to give you a gift, huh? um, if I can reach this, for the day when you decide to write a history of Silicon Valley. These are the papers of Bernard M. Oliver. Oh, and he was, the, um, he was the director of the research labs at Hewlett Packard Corporation for many, many years. Chris has just tipped me off, 32 years. 32 He's the years. person who said, when they said, we'd like to make a little calculator that's portable, <laughs> he said, well, it has to fit in my pocket. And that was a criteria for making the handheld calculator. He wrote articles about what happens as you approach the speed of light in starships, et cetera, et cetera. I think you'll find this Thank an interesting you. addition that's to wonderful. your library and a resource for when you write the history we'll of the Silicon find, Valley. We'll have to, to kind of jack up the publishers because I proposed last year a history of the the digital age, I called it, to, to my publisher, and they couldn't even get close to it. They well, just didn't think there'd be enough readers for a book like that. There's a whole valley full of them. So let's thank Richard Rhodes. <laughs> thank you.